Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Good to see all of you here. We are in the book of Joshua, if this is uh, your first time, if you're visiting, and we are in chapter 8. It's a lengthy chapter, verses 1 through 35. I'm not going to read the entire chapter because much of it I will read as we uh, go through the, the sermon, but... Uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9, and then I'll end with verse 30. But first, some background. Uh, If you were here last week, you know in chapter 7, Israel fought its second battle in the land of Canaan against this very small city, insignificant city of Ai. And they lost. 36 men were killed. Joshua learned that someone had taken things from Jericho that were under the ban, that were dedicated to the Lord, and uh, that was forbidden. And so there was sin in the camp, and Israel would never have victory again until they corrected that crime, until they dealt with the sin. And so through a process of drawing lots, The guilty man was discovered, Achan was discovered, and he was punished, he was stoned. Justice was done. Things were corrected. Now chapter 8. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king just as you did to Jericho and its king. You shall take only its spoil and its cattle as plunder for yourself. See an ambush for the city, set an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua, with all the people of war, uh, so Joshua rose with all the people of war to go up to Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 men, valiant warriors, and sent them out at night. He commanded them, saying, See, you are going to ambush the city from behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and when they come out to meet us at the first, we will flee before them. They will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say they are fleeing before us as at the first. So we will flee before them. And you shall, you shall rise from your ambush and take possession of the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. Then it will be when you have seized the city that you shall set the city on fire. You shall do it according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. So Joshua sent them away. And they went to the place of ambush, and they remained behind Bethel and Ai, on the west side of Ai. But Joshua spent the night among the people. Well, the battle occurred as planned. The city was captured and burned. The army of Ai was trapped and defeated. After that, the nation went north to the town of Shechem, and we read in verse 30, Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. That's a good hymn. Touches on some of the themes that I will touch on this morning. A few weeks ago, I mentioned Winston Churchill. Read something about him recently that is helpful to know since some consider him to be the greatest leader of the 20th century. 
One night in 1940, when he learned that he would be prime minister, he wrote, I felt as if I were walking with destiny, and all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. His past life that prepared him included some major defeats, such as his responsibility for the disaster at Gallipoli in World War I. His wife said, after that, I thought he would die of grief. That sounds like Joshua after the disaster at Ai. Joshua tore his clothes, he prostrated himself on the ground before the ark until the evening and cried out, Alas, O Lord God, why? It may be true that victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Still, we all have to own defeat sometime. And the fact is, we can learn from our defeats. Great leaders have. Joshua did. When he learned Achan violated the ban on the treasures in Jericho, he dealt with that sin. Then went forward to fight again. That's the lesson of Joshua 8. Joshua and Israel learned from their defeat, and they never took sin lightly again. It's a lesson for us. We need to learn that lesson. The Apostle John warns of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. As long as we are in the world, we'll feel the pull of the world toward worldliness. We are at war continually with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Their, their influence is subtle, but strong and constant, and we won't always win the battles. We stumble and fall. So what do we do? John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confessing to the Lord is the response. It is the right response. In fact, John was saying that that is one of the evidences of being born again. We confess our sins regularly. When we fail, we repent, then go forward in our walk with the Lord and learn from it. That's what Joshua and Israel did after Achan. They confessed the sin, they dealt with it, then they resumed their war. And from the ashes of defeat, they went up to victory. But that march to victory began with a word from the Lord, a word of encouragement, of reassurance. That's how chapter 8 begins. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. That was the encouragement Joshua needed. The words, do not fear or be dismayed, recall the assurance that God gave him back in chapter 1. Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. That statement reassured Joshua that the relationship with the Lord was restored to its previous condition and that all was well. And that's necessary because we will only limp along at best in the life of faith if we lack assurance. That can be lost when we sin and experience the Lord's discipline and have a wounded conscience. But when there is repentance, there is restoration. Not to salvation. Believers cannot lose their salvation, but they can lose their assurance. And so when that happens, people begin to doubt that they're saved. 
Again, it's, it's hard to go forward in the walk of faith when a person doubts if he or she is of the faith. Assurance is a necessary part of the Christian life, a necessary aspect of the Christian life if we're going to grow and progress. And it's based on God's promises. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. We, we recover from doubt by recalling the great promises that God has given. John Bunyan illustrated this in Pilgrim's Progress soon after Christian came to the cross and was off on the journey to the celestial city. He stopped to rest at a place that's described as a pleasant arbor on a hill. The, the shaded place was, was built there for weary pilgrims who needed rest. So Bunyan took his rest, but he did more than that. He fell asleep. A scroll was given to him at his conversion, and it fell out. It was the roll of the assurance of his life, of his eternal life. Well, when he resumed his journey, he was warned along the way of danger ahead. There are lions ahead. It terrified him. So he reached for the scroll to gain courage, and it was gone. He had to retrace his steps to find it. And only then could he go forward. When he did, he scolded himself for foolishly falling asleep when he should have been walking. How far I might have been on my way by this time, he said. Rather than making progress, he had to regress. Christians do that. They get distracted. They, they take it easy. They aren't attentive. And as a result, drift spiritually. And then lose assurance of salvation and become fearful and inactive. The solution is to do what Bunyan did, or rather what Christian did, and that is find the promises of God. That is the sure ground of, our, of the assurance of salvation. What has God said? John 3.16, Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And that's from the God who cannot lie. Uh, behavior, life and love give support. They are essential to that as well, to assurance. But it is God's Word, His fixed and certain Word, inerrant Word that is the basis of our assurance. We can examine ourselves, and we need to do that, and there's a proper place for that, but we can find so much fault within ourselves. But we can't find anything varying anything unstable, uncertain about the Word of God. It is the firm foundation and the promises of God give us the assurance we need. Now that's the point that Bunyan was illustrating in that scene in Pilgrim's Progress. And that's what Joshua had here. The Word of God. The, the promise of God. It was the assurance that the Lord gave him and the people of Israel and that settled it. I've given you this city. And then he sent Joshua back into the battle. The strategy for I was different from other battles. This involved ambush. The, the plan of attack is given in verses 3 through 9, which we read. It involved two groups. First group was made up of 30,000 men, valiant warriors, who would be sent out at night and hide behind the city to the west of the city, the west side of it. The second group was the, the main army led by Joshua. And this was, at least initially, a kind of diversionary force. They would come up early the next morning and approach the city from the north, which would be to the front of the city, in order to draw the army out of the city. 
when the Canaanite soldiers came out, the first group was to seize the city and set it on fire. Then the forces of Joshua would stop their retreat and turn and engage the army of Ai. At that time, this first group, the 30,000, would join the battle and attack the army of Ai from behind, closing the trap and sealing the fate of the Canaanites. It was a very conventional strategy, and we might wonder why the Lord chose this over the miraculous method that he used at Jericho. It, it worked well there. Calvin suggested it was so the people would not keep looking for miracles and would recognize that even in the natural occurrences of life, God is just as active. His power is the same. I think that is a good explanation. Uh, God doesn't always explain the reasons that He does things. He doesn't do things the same with everyone and in every situation, and we might wonder why. He doesn't explain that. But I think Calvin gives a good ex explanation. Christ changed water into wine. First miracle. John chapter 2. God is just as much involved in the natural process of viticulture, of culturing uh, grapes and turning them into wine, as He was in that miracle. And we need to understand that. He is never uninvolved in the events of the world or in our lives personally. We need to always be looking to Him for guidance, for strength, for help, and looking to Him and thanking Him for the outcome of whatever comes to be. So here He has chosen the natural over the supernatural for conquest which involved a lot of people, some 30,000 soldiers, just for the ambush. 30,000 to capture a city of 12,000. Why such a large army for such a small city? One suggestion is to, to keep them from boasting. If Israel had defeated I with a small number well, they might have attributed that to themselves. They might have attributed that to their valor, their skill. Uh, well, maybe that's the case. And, and there's reason to think so, because you'll remember in chapter 7, when the spies had, had, had gone out to look at the city, returned, they recommended that a small force be sent. Don't send all of the army, just a few, two or three thousand. This is a small city, insignificant. Their self-confidence was high. So high, they didn't feel the need of more than just a few troops. Now, God commands Joshua to take all the people of war. Now, that was the opposite approach. Perhaps to teach them an important lesson. To teach them that victory could not be achieved by self-confidence. It would not come by their strength or by their skill, but by God alone. When they did it their way, they lost. Only by following God's lead could they win. But they must follow Him. That is certainly true. Whether that's the lesson that we're to draw from here, whether that was the reason for this strategy, we can't say, but we can certainly say that that is a true uh, principle that we need to follow. Follow Him. Lean upon Him. Look to Him for our wisdom. Well, He had promised them victory. He had already given them the city. He had given them its king, its people, its land. It was all in their hands. And victory was now a foregone conclusion because this is what God had said. This is what He had promised. And that was great assurance in and of itself to trust Him and to go forward confidently in battle. They had the assurance that God had given them that this would be theirs. The victory was theirs. One of the great encouragements 
to continuing on in the faith, to perseverance, is the assurance that the saints, believers, will persevere to the end. Victory has been promised to us. The victory has already been won. That was one of the last statements that the Lord gave to His disciples before He was arrested and, and taken to trial and to the cross. He said in John 16, verse 33, at the end of the Upper Room Discourse, Take courage, I have overcome the world. Now that gives incentive to strive for the goal. I've overcome the world. Well, now Israel did that early the next morning. Strive for the goal. Go for the victory. According to verses 10 through 13, the main army marched to Ai, led by Joshua. And the next day they positioned themselves for the battle. In verses 14 through 29, the, the battle is described. The plan worked as intended, as, as laid out. The men of Ai hurried and rose up early in the morning, and they went out to meet Israel in battle. When Israel pretended to be defeated and fell back in a kind of a mock retreat, the men of Ai became confident of victory. They went after them. Verse 17 says, So not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who had not gone out after Israel, and they left the city unguarded and pursued Israel. Then at God's command, Joshua stretched out his javelin toward I, for God said, I will give it into your hand. That was the signal for those behind the city to enter it and set it on fire. But it was more than that. According to verse 28, Joshua kept the javelin raised all through the whole battle. Just as Moses kept his staff raised during the battle with Amalek in Exodus 17. You remember how he held his, his uh, hands up, his staff up. And as long as the staff was held up, Israel prevailed against the Amalekites. But when his arms became tired and he let the staff down... The Amalekites, Amalekites prevailed. So two men, Aaron and Hur, were there to hold up his arms, and he held them up all through the battle, and they prevailed. And I'm sure that the army would have taken that into their consideration. They would have made the connection as they're fighting these men of Ai. They could see that javelin raised, and it recall, they recalled that event, the generation before, and it was an encouragement to them because it reminded them, assured them that the Lord was with them and that they would have victory. That the promise He had given to them would be fulfilled. It was His victory. So we read in verse 20, When the men of Ai turned back and looked, behold, the smoke of the city ascended to the sky, and they had no place to flee this way or that, for the people who had been fleeing to the wilderness turned against the pursuers. The 30,000 that captured the city then joined the battle. As Joshua and his forces moved against the, the men of Ai, this other force, the 30,000, came trapping the soldiers of Ai between the army of Israel where the Canaanites were defeated and destroyed. Israel's army then returned to the city, slew its inhabitants, took the cattle and the spoils of victory, hung the king of Ai on a tree, and then razed the city to the ground. So after a major setback, the nation regrouped, reconsecrated itself and rose from the ashes of defeat to accomplish a decisive victory over the enemy. Verse 29 ends, the, the pile of stones of this city stands to this day. It was another monument for Israel's remembrance of the wages of sin and the judgment of God. Now many would call that 
rough justice, meaning severe and unfair. But again, this has to be considered in context. This was not a common practice. This was unique to the Canaanites, destroying the entire population. It was consistent with what the Lord told Abraham centuries earlier in Genesis 15, verse 16. The iniquity of the Amorite, which at that time has not yet complete, was now complete. God had been patient with them for centuries, and their sin had only increased. And so justice came. It was swift and complete. It was not unfair. God cannot be unjust. As Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Yes. He always does. He always will. He must. He's the Lord God. People have a problem with God's justice. Not because God judges people unfairly, but because people judge themselves unfairly and much too generously. The question of the medieval theologian Anselm of Canterbury applies to us. He asked, have you not yet considered of what a grievous weight sin is? And the answer to that is no. People have not considered that. People don't realize how truly sinful sin is and how guilty we all are. What a weight, a heavy weight sin is. Anselm's point was, this is the reason God became man. This is the reason that Jesus Christ, God's Son, took on human nature. Sin is so bad that only the death of the Son of God could remove it. Only the death of Christ could make atonement. Over the centuries, Canaan had become a land of gross immorality and an unspeakable cruelty, where pagan altars were stained with the blood of their own children. And finally God said, enough. God's justice is impartial. It is only for the guilty. It fell on Achan, an Israelite, just as it fell on the king of Ai, a Canaanite. Well, following the victory at Ai, Joshua did something unexpected. Instead of moving quickly to the next battle, Joshua interrupted the war to take Israel on a pilgrimage north to Shechem. It's a reminder that, that we can never be too busy for worship, that the tasks we are engaged in are never more important than the time that we give to honoring the Lord and spend in spiritual refreshment. In fact, that is how we protect ourselves from worldliness and the encroachments of the world and the flesh and the devil in our lives. Uh, this is how we remind ourselves of who we are and how dependent we are on the Lord. It's through worship. So now in the midst of the campaign to conquer Canaan, Israel breaks from battle to obey the instruction Moses gave earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 27 to go to Shechem and reaffirm the covenant. Shechem is located about 20 miles north of Ai between two mountains. Mount Ebal, the highest of the two, stands to the northeast, Mount Gerizim to the southwest, a valley in between them. The site is significant in Israel's history because, um, among other things, Jacob dug a well there, Joseph was buried there, and the Lord Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman there. In John chapter 4, it's named, the town is named Sychar, but it's Shechem. It was also significantly at this place where Abraham built his first altar to the Lord after leaving Ur 
and entering Canaan. And before he did, this is where the Lord spoke to him and told him that he would give the land to his descendants. And so Abraham built an altar there at Shechem, the first one he built in Canaan. And that's probably for that reason that Moses chose Shechem as the place for this ceremony, as well as the fact that it's located in the central part of Canaan, which is a kind of symbolic place for the whole of the land. And so... Some 600 years after Abraham built his first altar in Canaan, Joshua and the nation marched 20 miles north along the tops of the hills in complete safety to build an altar there. Verse 30 states that the altar was built on top of Mount Ebal. And following Moses' instructions... It was built of uncut stones on which no man had wielded an iron tool. Verse 31. It was an altar that did not have any of the works of man on it. According to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 25, after the Lord's given the Ten Commandments, He speaks of an altar and He t- speaks of how the, the, the using a, a tool to make it uh, nice in appearance, using a human tool on it, would profane the altar. So the stones were left in pristine condition, signifying that the altar was pure. Then they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Verse 32 states, He, Joshua, wrote there on the stones a copy of the Law of Moses, which, had been, which, had, which he had written in the presence of the sons of Israel. The stones referred to were large stones that, according to Moses, were to be whitewashed and inscribed with the law. I assume it's the Ten Commandments that are written there. The, the symbols of the altar and the law gave a message to both Israel and to Canaan, to the Israelites and the Canaanites, that the land was the Lord's. And this was like planting a a flag in the middle of the land, claiming it. In fact, they weren't set up after the fact, but before the fact. That is, before the land was conquered. The conquest has just begun, and they're already setting up this altar, this flag, so to speak, to make the statement that they possess it. God promised it, and they were certain it was theirs, and it was. I think it's a little bit like those soldiers on Iwo Jima in the Second World War who, in the middle of the battle, raised the American flag on Mount Suribachi to defiantly signify that victory was certain. But Israel's confidence was not in themselves. Israel's confidence was not in the power of its army, but in the power of God and faith in His promises. He had said the land was theirs, and they believed it, and they took it. Faith that led to repentance after defeat and resumption of the mission is seen here. After that terrible defeat at Ai, They reconstitute their relationship with the Lord. They learn from that defeat and they go forward, not only to conquer I, but then to make this great declaration of their intention and their belief there at Shechem. Well, their flag was an altar. Half the tribe stood on Mount Gerizim, the mountain to the south, and half on Mount Ebal to the north. The Ark of the Covenant was in the valley between the mountains, surrounded by priests. And then the Levites read the law loudly. The details of this are recorded in Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28. As the Levites read the curses for breaking the law, the people on Mount Ebal said, Amen. And as they read the blessings for keeping 
the law, the tribes on Mount Gerizim said, Amen. The geography helped. The, the two mountains in the valley have been described as a natural amphitheater in uh, an area large enough for the, for the nation. Uh, all of this was an important object lesson for Israel, uh, indicating what would happen to them in the land depending on their obedience to the law. A reminder of how important obedience was. Obedience was represented uh, by Mount Gerizim and the blessings that would come from it. Disobedience uh, was represented on Mount Ebal and the consequences of that. Two mountains, two choices, two ways of life, and two different ends. The nation had already been given an illustration uh, of this in their experiences in Canaan. Uh, the obedience resulted in victory at Jericho, while disobedience resulted in defeat at Ai. Those two events are, are their lessons, and their lessons uh, must have uh, been in their thoughts as this whole ceremony was going on, as these people recited the blessings and the curses, especially the curses. And they had learned from their failure. Ebal was a severe mountain, like Mount Sinai, and a reminder to them of the broken law. But on that mountain was the solution. It wasn't on Mount Gerizim, it was on Mount Ebal, and that was the altar. And it's significant that before the, the, the law was written and recited there at Shechem, before it was written on that altar, the altar had already been prepared. The altar had already been built, as if to say that the Lord had already made provision for sin. The law was not that provision. The law is not that solution. It could not and cannot remove sin. Paul explained the law's function in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. The law came in that the transgression might increase. So the law was given to reveal God's righteousness and expose man's sin. Show man his failure to meet God's perfect standard. Israel had a long history of failing to meet the standard. Fortunately, Israel had more than the law. It also had the altar as the way to remove sin and approach God. And that altar on Mount Ebal looked forward to the ultimate solution, the cross of Christ. You see that pictured here in the pristine condition of the altar. It was made of rough, uncut stones, never touched by human tools, it had no marks of human workmanship. And so it is with our Lord. The cross was not attractive, as that altar was not attractive. But the cross and the work of the cross, the work of Christ, was pure. His work was His work alone. No man added a work to the Lord's work of salvation on the cross. We had no part in our salvation. We were rescued, pure and simple. It was His work alone because only that sacrifice, that sacrifice alone could atone for sin and remove from us the curse of the law and the guilt of sin. Paul wrote of both the law and the, the cross in Galatians 3, to the man who wants to earn his salvation by good works, by law-keeping, he wrote in verse 10, as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Seeking to be justified by works brings a curse. And then he wrote in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Well, he took the curse as our substitute when he was hung on the tree, the cross. 
that solution and, and salvation were represented here by what was on top of Mount Ebal, on top of the mountain of curses, the altar which looked forward to Calvary, where Christ became a curse for us. Because of what he did for us there at the cross, when we stumble and fall and sin, we can get up. We can get back in the race. We can resume the fight because He has already atoned for all our sins. Now that is both liberating and motivating. It's liberating because the believer in Jesus Christ is saved at the moment of faith and saved forever. All because of what Christ has done. He paid for all our sins and we lay hold of that and it becomes ours through faith. We don't need to strive to gain God's acceptance or His approval. We have that at the moment of faith and we have it forever because Christ has done it all. Salvation is complete in Him and absolutely sufficient. And because it is, He'll never cast us off. We're still sinners. We're weak and we still fail. But the Lord reassures us that His love is constant and His grace, which is unconditional, empowers us and restores us. Now that is motivating. Grace never encourages sin or sloth or indifference toward righteousness. Anyone who, who understands grace as a pretext for sin is either ignorant or lost. No Christian at all. When we understand grace, which is God's unconditional love for the unworthy, when we understand that, we are made grateful to Him. And gratitude galvanizes a desire to obey and please the Lord, not dishonor Him. And when we sin, He's made provision for that. It is first discipline, not to destroy, but to correct. And when it occurs, there's confession and repentance and then rejoining the fight and victory. Now, we also need to help one another in all of that, in that race of faith, in that battle, spiritual battle that we fight. Paul told the Galatians in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. And then he adds, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. A good word of caution because sin is alluring. It is strong. It draws us. Achan was an example of that. Sin's contagious. It's easy to get caught up in it. So, restore the individual, Paul is saying, but do so very cautiously. But we're to help one another in all of this. Now, that's the Christian life. It's not lived singly. It's not lived on one's own. We are a body and we help one another. And because of the war casualties that we need to be helping one another. But we deal with it with the help of others to confess, to repent, and, and rededicate ourselves to the fight and go forward in that battle with confidence. That's God's will. It was for Israel. It recovered from failure. It learned from its failure and resumed its mission to win a great victory. And then out of gratitude, worship the Lord. And in so doing, make a declaration of its confidence in the Lord's promises. I think that's a pattern for us, how we're to live. But it's all based on the sacrifice of Christ, what He did for us on the cross, the altar at Calvary, where His blood was shed as a sacrifice for us, when He became a curse for us 
As I said, we appropriate that sacrifice and the forgiveness that it obtained through faith. That's how we lay hold of it. So, I ask you, have you done that? Have you believed? Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ alone and His sacrifice? If not, come to Him. Believe in Him. Join yourself to Him. You can never be separated from Him when you come to Him. Even when you stumble and fall. In fact, He will help you to stand and continue to fight the good fight to the end. And we will, as His children, persevere to the end and enter the great glory that is to come. May God help you to do that. Let's bow in a word of prayer. And I'll give thanks for the bread and the wine that we are about to celebrate. Father, we do thank you for this time together, this opportunity to study together. We take a passage of ancient history, but one that shows your providence, your guidance, your, your enablement of your people, and we can take the principles from that and apply them to our lives. We're in a battle too. It's invisible. We don't see it. We don't really feel it so much, but it's ongoing and it's subtle. And Father, we need your strength, supernatural strength. And we need to be men and women that study your word, learn the principles of the scriptures that, uh, that educate us on who you are, what you've done, what you're going to do, and the promises you've given us. We need to know these things and learn these things and continue to study them and grow as we do. But Father, we thank you for your power that enables us to stand and, and re regathers us when we fall. So Lord, we thank you for that and we thank you for this opportunity to worship because that too is critical to our growth. We so need to remind ourselves weekly of what you have done for us of the gift of grace and the gift of your Son and his sacrifice for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless us now as we turn our attention to this supper in which we remember your Son and remember the love of you that sent him into the world for us. We pray that you would strengthen us and sanctify us and bless us as we do this. We look to you to bless now. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's stand and sing number 16 on the song sheet, He Will Hold Me Fast. Number 16. In the Apostle Paul's account of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read it a couple of weeks ago, uh, he described the inauguration of the supper with this simple description that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup of wine also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Two of the most basic everyday staples of living, bread and wine, were the only implements he chose to ordain as the necessary items for the church to utilize in their future remembrances of him. That was surely so that he might highlight the deep truth behind what the bread and the wine represented. His body and blood offered up as a sacrifice for sin. The bread was his body, he said, the wine, his blood. Flesh and blood. We know what's meant by that phrase, flesh and blood. It means a real human being. Jesus wished to emphasize that he was a real human being. It was necessary 
that the eternal Son of God assumed flesh and blood when he came to accomplish our salvation. That's why we call it the incarnation. It means in the flesh. Uh, only a real human, real flesh and blood could offer himself in the place of another human to bear the penalty for their sin. Now, the author of Hebrews makes that point perhaps better than any of the writers of Scripture. And I want to just read now the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, to magnify that as we move now to observe the supper. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels. You remember the author of Hebrews is arguing about the superiority of Jesus, uh, and he starts with angels. Assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. He gives help to people who by faith seek the approval of God. Therefore, he had the author of Hebrews said, uh, this is the language of obligation. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of all those who are tempted. That might be a bit of an understatement to say, as he does, concluding that great second chapter of Hebrews, that Jesus came to our aid. But one very important aspect of what we remember and celebrate when we partake of the Lord's Supper is that God became incarnate in the person of his Son. He became a man in order to save us, to come to our aid, a real man of flesh and blood who could truly be and act as a substitute for all those out of the human race whom God in grace chose to be united to his son by faith. And now as we do week to week, we invite all those who by faith have obtained this aid the Savior has purchased to participate with us now as we partake of the bread and of the wine in remembrance of his body and blood offered for us. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we do thank you for this, as we said, very simple element, the bread that you said represents your body. You came in the flesh you became a real person, and, but you were also and are uh, holy God, infinite God. And so, Father, we celebrate this morning uh, the fact that you accomplished salvation for us by offering an effective sacrifice for our sins. That, as the author of Hebrews said, propitiated our God. Thank you, Lord. Bless now our remembrance. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to read Luke 24, verses 13 through 27, and then make a few comments. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? 
And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. That we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had, said, had also said, but he himself they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scripture. Three things. First, in the darkest times, when we are tempted to despair, as these two disciples were, God is at work doing great things. He is in control. We should never despair. Second, Jesus said it was necessary for him to suffer and die which is proof that the cross is the only way of salvation. There is no salvation apart from faith in Christ as God's eternal Son and His death in our place. If you question that, then as Anselm said, you have not yet considered how great a weight sin is. Only the blood of Christ, the God-man, can remove sin and guilt. Thirdly, all of Scripture reveals Christ and His sacrificial death. It was prophesied in the, by the prophets. It is found all through the writings of Moses, all through the writings of the prophets, all through the Old Testament. If we, if we never understand that, we will not understand the Old Testament if we don't see Christ as the subject of it. We see it in our passage this morning in Joshua chapter 8, verse 30, and the altar on the mountain of sin. Christ's death saves sinners. Everyone who believes, which is everyone He has chosen. And so that's what we remember. We remember His death that alone saves, and the great gift that God has given us in the gift of His Son and His sacrifice for us. That's what the cup speaks of. It speaks of the shedding of His blood. So let's bow and give thanks for the cup and all that Christ has done for us. Father, we do thank You for that. You, in Your great love for us, as stated in John 3.16, sent Him into the world to die in order that all who believe in Him will be saved. And we thank You, Father, that by Your grace we believed. We thank You that he has, His death has atoned for our sins. Thank You for Him. Bless us with these thoughts as we take the cup, that we remember Him, remember You, remember our triune God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Been good to be with you again this uh, Sunday morning. Let's end our service with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a good week.
Run the race of faith, keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Hopefully see you next week.